we we talked a lot about magnesium and i think when i think magnesium your name is probably the top of the list so let's just let's wrap on magnesium a little bit um you mentioned magnesium deficiency can can lead to insulin resistance um and i've seen you post things about what staggeringly large percentage of the population based on age ranges are deficient in magnesium but why don't you walk me through some of that stuff and then we can talk about why you think so many people are deficient in this mineral. Yeah. So the range um, based on our review paper is really anywhere from about 20 to really upwards of 80% of the population could be deficient in magnesium. Um, And that's usually not even looking at the gold standard ways to measure. That's just looking at like basically low blood levels. Um, But sometimes they'll, they'll use like um, IV magnesium low tests where they essentially give about 400 milligrams of magnesium over four hours IV, and you see how much comes out in the urine over 24 hours. And if you, if the body's holding on to a certain percentage, then you're considered deficient. Um, and as you have more disease states, the increase in the prevalence of magnesium deficiency goes up. So osteoporosis is about the highest, been documented about 80% of people with osteoporosis has have magnesium deficiency. And then when you look at the quote unquote healthiest population that's been studied, like college students, you're looking at about 20% of those, but you're really not looking at gold standard tests like mononuclear blood cell, which is the only blood magnesium test that's actually been standardized to match IV magnesium load test. Um, It's probably even higher. So if I had to estimate on average, probably 50% of the US population is magnesium deficient to some degree. And even marginal deficiency increases the risk of arrhythmias, like there's been good studies showing that if you bring the magnesium intake down to 100, 110 milligrams, one out of three people develop atrial fibrillation. Um, so we know that you want to be consuming obviously more than 100 milligrams of magnesium. The studies that I've looked at um, on a typical standard American diet um, have shown that you have to get at least at the bare minimum 150 to 180 on a standard American diet. Otherwise, you will uh, slowly deplete the body of magnesium. So if you're on a whole nutritious diet, might be able to get away with maybe 125 milligrams of magnesium and still remain in balance. Of course, that doesn't mean optimal intake. And one of the things we talked about in our last podcast, which seems like a lifetime ago, was the fact that I think we agreed on this then, that that a lot of magnesium deficiency probably happens because so much of the population is obese and insulin resistant, and that causes wasting of magnesium. Right. Yes. Yeah. Hyper, <laughs> hyperinsulinemia will increase the loss of magnesium in the urine. And it will also decrease the ability of magnesium to get into the cell. And so you basically, your body is in, unable to utilize magnesium because there is a significant insulin component to driving both magnesium and potassium into the cell. So if the cell becomes insulin resistant, you're almost automatically deficient in magnesium now because you can't really get it into the cell very well. So that's a kind of an overlooked reason or cause for magnesium deficiency is literally the cell becoming insulin resistant. Is the um, mononuclear cell magnesium blood test available widely? I'm going to, no, No, you can't get it like LabCorp. It's more of a research tool. You can see Uh if you can get it. Um, But yeah, that's more of a research tool. But you know what? Here's what's interesting is... um, If you raise the cutoff on blood magnesium to a more optimal cutoff, blood can actually be a fairly good indicator. So the typical cutoff for magnesium deficiency is less than 1.7 milligrams per deciliter. But our review paper showed that if you're less than two milligrams per deciliter and you have a low urinary magnesium, that is very highly indicative of magnesium deficiency. So With any nutrient, you always want to have two measurements, whether it be blood plus urine or mononuclear cell plus blood. You always want to have at least two measurements to sort of try to indicate if you are deficient or not. Have you ever done any of those blood tests on yourself? That'd be so interesting. I haven't, um, but I I do the inside tracker blood test and my my magnesium is always around two, 2 Uh 2.1. It's never less than two, which is really, you don't want to be less than two, ideally. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I can go back and look at my blood work real quick in this podcast and, and let everybody know what my magnesium was. But uh, um, I'm going back to, I'm going to Los Angeles in the next couple of weeks. I'm going to get some more blood work. And I wonder, I bet urinary magnesium is something people could get very easily. And yep. so if people are curious about magnesium status, you could just do a blood level of magnesium and a urinary magnesium. Then 
Yes, because um, there's urine test strips. Vivu is one company that will measure magnesium in the urine. Essentially, a third of your dietary magnesium comes out in the urine. So if you're consuming 300 milligrams in the diet, 100 will come out in the urine. So typically, when you're below 100, you're probably you're not you're not probably getting a good amount of magnesium. Yeah. But yes. that would you'd have to do like a 24 hour urine for that. That would be that would be a 24. But um, there are there are urine test strips. Uh, basically that will just kind of calculate that out for you in a spot test. Um, again, nothing's perfect, which is why you always want to have two tests. Yeah. That's interesting. A, um, a, a urinary spot. That's cool. Now blood isn't perfect, right? Because, you know, you can have a normal blood, but your ionized magnesium is low. Okay. So there's a magnesium is super complex. You know what I mean? Um, Actually, ionized magnesium is better, but in certain yeah, things, but- you can actually raise serum magnesium, but cause serum or cause magnesium deficiency. Like if you're on a thiazide diuretic, it's been right. shown to actually raise serum levels of magnesium, but to cause magnesium deficiency. So there's a lot of you know intricacies on this. Interesting. So would you? Would, is it worth somebody checking a an ionized magnesium? Yeah, I think so. I think there's some worth and, and some value there. Um, and there's been studies actually that have shown that serum ionized magnesium actually matches intracellular um, ionized magnesium very well, which is really what you're looking for, right? Because most magnesium is in the cell and the active form is the ionized. You mm-hmm. can't get an ionized magnesium in the cell test very easily. So to know that there's studies showing that the serum ionized matches very well with what's going on in the cell, that, that that's a good test to get. Oh, cool. Interesting. So I'll probably, I'm going to probably get a serum mag and ionized mag. And maybe, maybe if I can, maybe if I can find some spot urinary magnesium strips in the States, I'll post about it. But my magnesium, the last time I had a check was um, two. So that's perfect too. It's like maybe a little better. So just for the sources of magnesium, we can run through these for people in your daily diet. Where do you get magnesium? I know you supplement as well, probably, but yeah, in your diet, maybe you don't even need to supplement. Uh, so it's hard to say because I used to eat more fish, which is higher typically in magnesium and shellfish um, versus like, let's say land animal meat. Um, although you can get a D you can get a decent amount. If you're consuming like, you know, typically I think a pound of meat is around 50 to 75 milligrams of magnesium around thereabouts, maybe up to a hundred, depending on yeah, some food. estimates I've seen are over a hundred. Yeah. Yeah. The ranges are completely different. Of course, it's always going to happen, right? Depending on the feed and, and what animal you're looking at, but a good range would be 50 to hundred milligrams of magnesium per pound of meat. Um, so you're, you're ideally hoping to get about 150 milligrams of magnesium as a bare minimum, which is why I typically always get at least hundred milligrams as a supplement because I know my diet isn't super, super high in magnesium because all the things that I used to eat that are high in magnesium, I don't really eat anymore, like nuts and spinach and all these other quote unquote high magnesium things. They have other, you know, harms at high doses. So it's like, oh, interesting. Warm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you eat those foods anymore? Uh, well, number one, they don't really taste very good <laughs> to be fair. Like, you know, I, I was sick of just like, you know, trying to force spinach down my throat. Yeah. Um, mainly why I think there's a little more joint issues I was having too, when I was eating more of those foods. Oxalates? Potentially. Yeah. Yeah. I'm having Sally Norton on the podcast next week and she just wrote a book, Toxic Superfoods. So that's kind of cool. I've been kind of geeking out on oxalates again, but I've always thought about that. My magnesium was lowest based on my subjective experience and my blood work, which was a different type of blood work. It was like a spectrocell you know, some of these functional medicine labs, my magnesium was in the toilet when I was raw vegan, eating tons of leafy greens and tons of almonds. I've always wondered, at least in things like almonds, how bioavailable the magnesium is because there's phytic acid and there's oxalates, which we know are going to prevent the absorption of the magnesium. I mean, there's been parallel studies with other divalent cations like zinc with oysters and beans and wheat and tortillas. And and the spinach thing is a real problem because you're just going to get a I mean, spinach is just an oxalate bomb. It's, there's so much. We just, I think today we just did a reel on oxalates in a smoothie and two cups of spinach is like 450 milligrams of oxalates. And people can listen to the podcast with Sally for the full oxalate download, but probably we want to have 50 to 100 milligrams of oxalates per day in our diet. And so a lot of these foods that are supposedly really great high in magnesium are oxalate bombs. Right. Um, I was, I was encouraged to learn that with my diet, um, Coconut water has a good amount of magnesium. And so 
I'm lucky to be in Costa Rica. I can just get coconuts like mm. all the time. Um, so most of what I drink is coconut water these days. I don't actually drink um, water. Um, all of the low carbers, I love you, will will get get triggered at that. But so be it. Um, but it's really high in magnesium. And milk is actually pretty good for magnesium. A couple cups of milk has a good amount of magnesium. Orange juice has a good amount of magnesium. And there was at least one more thing that I was eating every day that had a good amount of magnesium. But between between the milk, the orange juice, and the um, meat, you're in there for meat. So. The meat, yep. The meat and the coconuts. I was getting over 400 milligrams of magnesium per day in my diet. So that's really interesting. Yeah, but I think that a lot of people are deficient. They're not getting enough. And you guys can use chronometer or whatever you want to like look based on the USDA database. But getting enough magnesium is, is pretty critical. 